Okay, I think we're good to get started. Uh, so I'll just introduce myself first. So I'm Sam Gregory. I'm the Soccer Intelligence Team Lead at SportLogic. And so this is going to be the first of a few webinars we're going to do at SportLogic. Um, today is just going to focus on tracking data, how you can use tracking data within a club. Um, but we plan to do a few more in the future across multiple sports. So I'm working mostly on soccer here at SportLogic, but we work across hockey, football, and are starting to work in lacrosse as well. So hopefully we'll have a wide variety of sports that we're looking into, but today we're going to focus on uh, tracking data in football. Um, so I'm joined by my friend Devin Pluler, who is the Senior Manager of Analytics at the Eastern Conference MLS Champions Toronto FC. Uh, hey, thanks for uh, having me, Sam, and uh, happy to chat all things uh, tracking data for you here today. Um, hopefully we can demystify it as, as much as possible. <laughs> thanks for joining. Uh, I guess, what are we, like nine days out now from MLS Cup? Um, yeah, November 10th. Wow, that's sooner than I thought. Um, yeah, crazy. It's been a wild, really, a wild, wild year for sure. Um, so today I want to start by just kind of introducing what tracking data is uh, and some of the challenges that come with tracking data and using it in kind of more applied fashion. Um, so first off, tracking data is essentially for our purposes today is any data set that comes with a high degree of sampling, so a sampling rate that is uh, multiple times per second. So the tracking data you're looking at here is 25 frames per second. Um, and what we get is an XY location, or in some cases with the ball, an XYZ location of multiple tracks. So here you can see this, we're sampling at a rate of, one, of 25 times per second. We're getting the XY locations of each player, the referees, and the ball. Um, this is a full tracking system, so we're getting all 22 players, but there are a couple different tracking systems we'll talk about a bit later. But what, essentially what we have here is an incredibly rich data set, but a data set that doesn't have any information about uh, the types of events that are happening or any kind of, um, any kind of clear uh, breakpoints, just a continuous data set that continues throughout the course of an entire match. Uh, so some of the, the different types of tracking data we have, we've got in-stadium optical tracking data, and this is the tracking data that I think most people would be most familiar with. So this is where six or more cameras are installed at different angles within the stadium. Uh, and the advantage of this is you have really good coverage of the pitch. So uh, occlusion is one of the biggest issues of tracking data and occlusion is just where one player is blocking the view of another, is blocking the camera's view of another player. With multiple camera systems installed in stadiums, you don't tend to get this too often because you have these multiple views. Um, the reliability of the data is very good. The problem is it's expensive, requires you to install this system within a stadium or there's some mobile uh, solutions, but even they are more expensive and require uh, you to, to install something the day of the game. Um, and you're usually only limited to your own league and sometimes even your own team. So it's more useful for things like opposition analysis or uh, own team analysis, but it has pretty limited use in scouting, uh, especially outside of your own league. And then we have GPS tracking. So this is often used for physical data. Um, and it's just where players will wear a GPS on their jersey or somewhere while they're uh, either of the course of a game or over training. Uh, this gives accurate physical data, uh, but the problem is you're only ever going to get data on your own team through this, and not all players are, uh, are going to always be wearing the GPSs. And the last type of tracking I want to talk about today is broadcast tracking. Um, so broadcast tracking, I say broadcast tracking, but it's essentially single camera tracking. So this can be from either a tactical feed, a wide angle lens, um, or from the actual broadcast feed itself. So some of the advantages of this is that's by far the most inexpensive. All you really need is the game to be televised and you can run it through a tracking system. Um, and you have by far the widest coverage in terms of leagues. So you have any game that's on TV, you can get it. And this includes historical games. So one of the issues of tracking data is you only will have data once the cameras are installed with six camera tracking systems. But with broadcast track, you can go back and get historical data. Um, the downsides, of course, are you don't get the whole pitch. So a lot of production decisions will affect the data you get. So uh, the example I always point to is if you look at an MLS broadcast, it tends to be much more zoomed in than broadcast from Europe. And so you'll get, you tend to have fewer players on the screen at any one time with an MLS broadcast than you will with European games. Um, so some, one of the main challenge that I would say comes from tracking data is just the size of it. So with an Opta F24 feed, you're getting about 2,000 events per match. So this is a data feed that essentially has 2,000 rows, where each row is an event. 
if you think of an optical like six camera tracking system uh, for let's say a game last 95 minutes you have 26 tracks which well assuming there are no red cards there's 22 players in the pitch you're going to have the 22 players plus three referees plus the ball and if you're uh, sampling at a rate of 25 frames per second that gives you 3.7 million observations so you're uh, you're going from 2,000 events per match to 3.7 million observations per match which creates a lot of problems in terms of not just how to use the data, but storing the data, um, figuring out how to process it quickly. Uh, so these are some of the main issues, one of the main issues that comes to tracking data. And I think what kind of follows up from that is it makes it difficult to query. So with event data, it's really easy to link event data to video. You can uh, drag and drop uh, off to XML feeds or whatever XML feed into sports code. And suddenly you can say, show me all the final third passes made by Kevin De Bruyne. And the, the good things about this is that it's easy, you can easily query the video from the track, from the event data. And we all know what a final third pass is. It doesn't matter if you're getting this from different vendors. The definition of what a final third pass is is roughly going to be the same. With tracking data, we don't really have these clear agreed upon definitions yet. Um, and it's much more difficult to tie this data to video. So you can't necessarily say, because the data is so continuous, uh, it's really difficult to say, show me all the times where X event happened, unless you've defined X event yourself from the tracking data. Uh, and one of the problems that I think people don't consider as much is the fact that the data is continuous, but rows also occur simultaneously. So in event data, you'll have, for the most part, you'll have only one event happening at a time. So there's some exceptions. Uh, aerials is a common exception where there'll be uh, an aerial dual one lost at the same time. But for the most part, you'll have a shot event, a save event, uh, maybe a pass event after that, and they occur in sequence, so you can look at the events in sequence. Where with tracking data, you have 26 things that are happening at the same time. So you're detecting all of these tracks simultaneously, and often what you're interested in is not just one of these points, but how the points relate to each other, and how the points relate to each other over time. So you're adding multiple new dimensions in uh, than when you're just looking at a sequentially ordered uh, event data set. And I think that uh, all of these challenges, in addition to some of the uh, issues with data access, has meant that we really haven't seen any work done in the public. And I, um, this has changed a lot with event data recently. So if you look online, there's loads of uh, public sources. There's public source data you can get from StatsBomb. And this has led to a lot of public work that's made its way into the uh, club sphere. So I think expected goals is the best example. It's a metric that came from the public sphere, and now almost every club in the world is using expected goals in some way or another. Um, and if you look now, I think that the amount of public work that's available is exploding because of this, because of these publicly available data sets. I just searched StatsBomb on GitHub and found 50 repositories that use StatsBomb data. So if you're working at a club, you can easily bring this work into your club, um, and you can just essentially lift the code that someone's already done on this data set, use it internally in-house. And even if you're using a different provider, it's not too difficult to take the work that's been done with one data set and apply it to your own. But with tracking data, this really hasn't been the case with public work. Most of the work that we've seen in public has been academic work. Uh, and the academic work has been really, really good for in a lot of cases. So I think the most famous uh, tracking data paper out there is this uh, EPB paper from Javier, Luke, and Dan. Uh, and so this, these papers, which show up at Sloan or other uh, analytics conferences, tend to be pretty mathematically complex. Often it's not clear how to actually take the, what's being shown and apply it, even if you do think it's really cool and could have an impact in your club. And the other thing is the audience they're writing for is not really a club audience. So they're not looking to understand one specific thing. Uh, they're looking to show, up, to show something that will be appreciated at an academic concert, uh, at an academic uh, event or to an academic audience. And so this is meant that all the public work is sort of not really, although it's really high quality, it's not necessarily applied and easy to bring down to, to a club level and to use in your day-to-day -day workflow. So what I want to talk about today is sort of a, a framework for taking what's been done, for taking tracking data and making it a bit less complicated and a bit more applied and looking at ways that you can incorporate it into a, into a workflow that's only using event data right now. Um, and there's three basic ways that I kind of look at using tracking data, uh, applying tracking data in an event data workflow or trying to work it into an event data workflow. So the first is augmenting existing events, creating new events, and then modeling continuously over time. So the first one I'll look at is augmenting existing events. And I think this is sort of the natural place to start. So you have all of these events, 
And I think one of the critiques that event data, one of the main critiques of event data is that it misses out on context. So uh, expected goals, for example, if a coach asks you, does this expected goals model take into account the number of players between the shooter and the goal? You can come up with a lot of fancy answers that say, oh, well, it takes into account uh, the movement in the lead up to the shot, the assist type. And there's lots of information that you can sort of proxy for the number of defenders between the shooter and the goal. But if you're not able to say, yes, it takes into account this thing, which we know as a fact has an effect on the probability of scoring from any given shot, then you're going to have a, a more challenging time convincing people that your model is valuable. So I think this really is the natural place to start, which is filling in the holes with event data. Um, and I, the most difficult part with this is the actual merging of the data sets. So with event data, you have imperfect timestamps. Um, they can be anywhere from dead on to a few seconds off. Um, whereas with tracking data, you've got, uh, a f you've got data that's accurate to a fraction of a second. And depending on your use case, being right on that exact correct frame might make a big difference. Um, so if you're looking at a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today, it's okay to be a, like a, a couple frames off and you'll still get similar results. Uh, if you're looking at anything that's kind of physics based, uh, you really need to be on the exact frame. So if you're looking at ball trajectories or velocities, you really need to be on the exact frame. But I think for the most part, having a merge model which gets you to approximately the right frame of a pass or a shot event will give you a lot of additional information at a pretty accurate rate. Um, and there's, so there's two basic approaches on how to merge these data sets. So the first is the one that we've taken at SportLogic with uh, using a supervised modeling approach. This one is a bit more challenging because you need a properly annotated data set. So essentially what this is, is you take a data set uh, of, I'll say all the passes in a game and you have them evented to the exact correct frame from your video source. So you know the ground truth and then build a model with that as the target. Uh, problem with this is you need the properly annotated data set. So if you have the time to do it, I think this does give better results. Um, but for the most part, I think a rules-based logic approach using, using similar features will also give a uh, pretty good merge. Um, and it's much easier to implement because you don't have a data set that goes back. However, that data set that's properly annotated with the exact frame of different events. And I, it, from the two models, I think the feature sets that we use are pretty similar. Um, so the first thing that we've done, and I think most people do when looking at this, is you pick out a candidate frame range. So you have, let's say, a pass event. Um, and the pass event will occur at a certain timestamp, and you look at a window around that event. Um, I found in general that the eventing lag tends to be the event happens after, the event is marked as having happened slightly after, it tends to be the, bias, the direction of bias. So I'll put a window around the event, maybe a couple seconds before it's evented and a second or two after it's evented, and then look at a feature set within, those, within that candidate window. And so the things we look at are the distance of the player to the ball, um, and this can be identified from the event data and the tracking data. Um, the velocity, the, and uh, also you're looking at the player who the event data says was the player, so you can easily link up which player comes from the tracking data that should be making the pass. Uh, you look at the velocity and acceleration of the ball away from the player. Uh, is the ball moving away from the player and at what velocity at the time of the pass? The uh, acceleration tends to be increasing and the velocity is uh, at a certain level because the ball is moving towards another player. And then you can look at the difference in ball trajectory angle between the event. So where the, you have a rough idea of the trajectory from the event data because you know where the ball, where the pass originated and where it ended. And you can look at the angle of that trajectory versus the actual trajectory of the ball from the tracking data. So on the right here is an example. This actual visualization wasn't for a merge model. This was for uh, our intended recipient model, but the concept is roughly the same. So you have one line which is the pass from the event data or in our in this case it's the uh, is this player the intended recipient and you look at the angle between that pass and the pass that's being made um, to and the actual trajectory of the ball from the tracking data so once you have this merge which um, again depending on your use case you might need different uh, even different levels of accuracy. But once you have this, there's a lot of really easy things you can do to add more information to your event data. So the first is just looking at whether a pass is under pressure or looking at if any event is under pressure. There's some more complicated ways you can do this. You can look at things like the directionality of the pressure, the speed of the pressing player, but a really easy basic thing to do is just look at each pass event, narrow, narrow your search down to the opposition players and say, is there an opposition player within two meters of the player in possession? Um, 
And it's a really easy thing, which I, we found adds like a lot of value to things like passing models straight off the bat once you add this one additional feature, which is missing from most event data sets. Uh, and then you can start to look at what options the player system had, which again, this is one of the big critiques I think of event data is you only know what happened, not what could have happened. Um, and with, with the augmenting uh, these events with tracking data, you can look at what open passing lanes the player had. And this can be entirely geometric. So the way that we've done this uh, is just literally drawing um, polygons essentially from the player in possession to the potential recipient and then calling that a passing lane and looking if there's somewhat, if there's a, um, a player blocking that passing lane. But you can do even simpler things. So at the time of a pass, how many players were in front of, um, at the time of a pass, how many players were in front of the player passing, how many players were behind. So really, really simple metrics which add value to these passes, to these pass events. And then one thing we've done at SportLogic is looking at line breaking passes, but you can also do the simpler version, which is packing. This is a metric that comes from impact. Uh, which you just look at how many opponents does a pass bypass. Uh, and this is a really, really simple metric, uh, which you can do pretty easily with tracking data. Um, our version that we've done is looking at, is actually identifying defensive lines. We found doing 1D clustering on the X coordinate does a pretty good job of identifying where these defensive lines are. And we think there's more value in actually breaking a defensive line than just bypassing a player. Uh, so this is just a quick example of sort of what uh, a raw feed, what a tracking data looks like on an event once it's merged. So we're saying this is a pass event, this dark blue player is the recipient. Uh, and so the first thing we do is add these passing lanes that I mentioned. Then we look at which ones are open and blocked. So here, if there's a player, if there's a player in the passing lane, we're saying that it's a blocked passing lane. Obviously there's different degrees of openness and closed. I mean, you can look at this one and say, yes, it's open, but it's much more closed than say this one. So you can, it doesn't have to be a binary thing. Um, but then we've also looked at the, the defensive lines. So this pass that ended up happening also was through a closed passing lane and it broke a defensive line. So we've suddenly added a lot more context to this one event just by looking at a few simple uh, augmentations with tracking data. Um, you can do a lot of similar things with shots. So was a shooter under pressure? What was a shooter's view of goal? You can look at the number of players in that sort of triangle from the shooter to each post, which again improves expected goal models. And I think the most important thing you can do with this is looking at goalkeeper metrics. So a lot of, uh, I think one of the downsides of event data that we really haven't been able to solve with event data yet is the, um, to evaluate goalkeepers. Uh, and I think that using uh, tracking data gives you a better idea of where the goalkeeper was at the start of the shot, what percent of the goal they were covering, how much of, um, what, what percent of the goal they're covering? What was their position at the moment of the shot? What was their reaction time? A lot of these metrics you can get just by augmenting the shot event itself and maybe the save event. So the second thing I wanna talk about is creating new events from tracking data. So this is essentially, you have this event data feed and there might be specific things that your coach or that your team cares about that isn't being captured in this. And these tend to be like tactical events. Um, so if, a few examples are things like a fullback overlap. So this is something where we all know roughly what a fullback overlap is, but you're never gonna get it from event data. You might under, be able to impute kind of when a fullback receives a pass after they make an overlapping run, but you're not gonna be able to see how many times a fullback is overlapping. But this is a clear kind of distinctive, we all know what it is when we see it and it could be evented, um, but it would just, it would require a lot of work. Um, but you can easily augment this with tracking data. So you can say, uh, is the fullback within a certain number of meters of the ball, are they outside of the player of possession? You could even say the player in possession needs to be so close to the touch line or the fullback needs to be so close to the touch line and just look for the moment when the fullback moves from behind the ball to in front of it and you've suddenly created a new event, which is a fullback overlap. So again, this is an entirely geometrically defined thing, uh, but it's creating a definition for something that you're not getting from event data. Um, player pressure is another one. So I mentioned in the last part about a plan. Uh, adding tags to events about whether or not they're under pressure. But you can also look at whether um, whether pressure was applied regardless of whether or not there was an event. So a, a common thing you see with pressing players is they'll make a press, um, the player in possession will back up or make a, a suboptimal pass because of that. And the player's actually, his press has been successful. So he's kind of withdrawn his press by the time the event happens. And because of this, the, the event itself is under pressure, but we still want to credit that player with applying a pressure. So this is something where you can add a new event, which is just a player pressure. Um, and then some other things is just uh, adding new metrics at key moments or adding, creating key moments and looking for additional things. So 
the defensive line, defensive line height is a big one. So a lot of teams have asked us, okay, at the time of a turnover, at the time of a final third entry, where is our defensive line? How high are they? Uh, and this is a, a key moment that you've identified from tracking data. You said when the ball crosses the final third, I want to know where these players are, where this gap is. Um, and we can also look at things like opportunity to counterattack. So we looked at every time there was a turnover uh, in a team, a team won the ball back in their own half. Was there a gap between the players in the attacking zone and the defensive players in the defensive zone? And if there was, what was the numerical superiority of those players in the defensive zone? So say there are three defenders back and two forwards, that potential opportunity to counter. And you can identify these kind of key tactical moments by creating new events from tracking data. Uh, so this is an example of how we've identified uh, the height of the defensive line and the dotted line here is the midfield line at the point when a team enters their own half, or the opposition enters their own half. So again, this is a clue, uh, just a summary metric from a new event that we've created with tracking data. Uh, this is an example of player pressures. So these are all, these events are all player pressures, clearly here from a fullback. Um, and we've created a series of new events and plotted them on a, on a pitch map, just like any other event that you've seen plotted on a pitch map. I mean, it's not that different from just looking at a defensive action uh, plotting, but you have suddenly way more defensive actions because you're not just looking at on-ball defensive actions, you're looking at pressures as well. Uh, and this is sort of the next step that we've taken it. So this is a continuous pressure model. Uh, so this is looking at not just pressure as a binary one zero thing, but the degree of pressure that a player is under. Uh, so here, the player in uh, each player is actually exerting a degree of pressure on the ball. So we've just essentially put a Gaussian around each player and then summed up the total of these Gaussians on the player in possession. And here we can create new events, which are high pressure situations and then low pressure situations. So we can identify things like press breaks. So when did a player go from being in an area of high pressure to low pressure, whether that was dribbling out of a press or um, making a pass out of a press. And I think with binary pressure, it's really hard to identify press breaks because often, because we know pressure, when you break a press, it's not going from one to zero and uh, going away from one player pressing to you doesn't mean necessarily mean you've broken the press, even if you've gone from being under like a binary pressure to not under binary pressure. So I think this event gives a much better idea of how pressure is actually broken from an attacking perspective. And then the last one thing I wanna talk about briefly, and this is something we've seen a lot more of on the academic side, is continuous modeling. So really with tracking data, you have such a rich data set um, that to really take advantage of it, you do wanna look at how things occur over time. So you use that, that time dimension in addition to the extra context you're getting on each frame. Uh, the problem with this is the amount of data you use suddenly shoots way up because you need so many more, you're not just looking at one frame, you're looking at, if you're looking at two seconds worth of data, you're looking at 50 different frames. Um, but here, here you can start to take into account things like velocities, accelerations, and provide a bit more context uh, over more than a single frame. The other problem with this is the mathematical complexity tends to go up when you're looking at multiple frames, you're looking at modeling over time in addition to space. So here's a couple examples of things we've done. I don't wanna to go too in depth into this, but this was a presentation I did at Nessus. Um, and I'll be doing actually at Barcelona in a couple of weeks uh, on off the ball run types. Um, so this was essentially looking at the most common off the ball runs that players make and grouping them so that we can query it in the same way that you query pass types. So just look at all the runs that fall into this category. Uh, and it was just a way of using the kind of the continuous nature, taking the continuous nature of tracking data and bringing it down to an event level or something that's more easy to query. Uh, these are shot trajectories. Uh, there's a lot of really cool things you can do with shot trajectories. You can start to uh, examine a little more about uh, where players should have shot versus where they did shoot in the trajectories and how much they're adding from the actual trajectory of their shot rather than just the positioning of the shot. So we can look at, okay, this was the, uh, the expected goals of the shot at this point in time was, was this much. But with the actual trajectory the shot took, so not just where it ended up, but the curve that was placed on it, the velocity that the shot was hit with, we can say how much shooters are adding to their expected goal values or how much they're adding uh, as a finisher by looking at the trajectory of these shots. So we've started to do a bit of work with this and found some really cool, um, really cool things in terms of what players are doing uh, to their shooting ability uh, with the actual trajectories of the shot, not just the shot placement.
And with that, I'll pass it over to Devin to talk a bit about what he's actually done with Toronto so far. Cool. Uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, you can hear me okay, right? I was had myself muted during your bit there. Okay. Um, cool. So uh, first, you know, the, the, whole, the first section there from, from Sam, I think, is, is really very smart in, in a sense that it's pretty much how, I, from the experience that I've had with a lot of, you know, in, internally at Toronto here, but also speaking with other, other clubs around the world, is pretty much everybody's kind of taken the same sort of approach to integrating um, integrating tracking data, right? Um, the you know, augmenting of eventing stuff, I, I think, is probably the most important part. Um, and you know, because as, as Sam suggested, it, it adds so much more detail and you know, specificity to all these models um, that are so foundational to soccer analytics in general, right? Um, so that's that's huge, and we've loved you know working with Sport Logic on on some of that stuff so far. Um, so today I want to talk about, and it's a little bit kind of about, you know, the secondary part that Sam was talking about, about adding new events. Um, but essentially what I'm going to try to talk about here is trying, how do we, how do we apply additional, how do we capture tactical context? What is tactical context? Why do we need it? How do we get it? Um, so I have control over this screen now, right? Let's see. Sam, you want to just go to the next yeah. slide for me? Sorry, I guess that's not working. Um, so why do we need tactical context? Um, you know, augmenting events with tracking data it helps us better understand, you know, the difficulty and value of individual events, right? So one of the first things that we do with any sort of event is look at, you know, how, you know, how much is this adding to my, you know, chances of scoring on this possession versus how difficult it is, right? Um, and while, you know, those two things are positively correlated, generally the more difficult the pass is, the more valuable it is, that, that isn't a perfect one-to-one -one relationship, right? Um, and teams that find passes that are disproportionately valuable given their difficulty you know, tend to win more soccer games. Um, so, you know, how do we better understand, you know, um, you know, uh, the, the, the difficulty and the value of, of individual, individual events, um, but, but also, you know, re make the recognition that not all teams go about creating the, that value in the same way, right? Um, different teams apply different tactics um, and, and different systems of play uh, that affect all these different things, right? Um, and in general, um, you know, the, the coaches um, don't live in the world or speak the language of expected goals or past difficulty or things like that, right? They're, they're more likely to ask you questions that are like the three here that I've put here that are going to outline a couple different approaches, right? So, for example, the first one I've got here is uh, how often is a particular player unmarked in the weak side pocket, right? Um, and we'll go into defining exactly what that means and how to approach that in a minute. Um, the second one here is where is the left fullback when, you know, transition is initiated? Right, uh, that one's a little bit more straightforward in terms of what it means, uh, but it's pretty hard to define. Uh, and the last one, and I think the most abstract, um, and, and you need to apply some really tricky things that can answer this sort of question. I think is, uh, can you find another instance where this particular tactical situation appeared? Right, you know, um, and all of these are much more realistic in theater sort of questions that you would get. Um, from a coaching staff, right? Um, you know, they, they generally don't speak the, the language that we've built among analysts to speak to each other, right? We, we need to bridge a, a much different sort of communication mission gap. Um, you want to hit the next slide, Sam? Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is handcrafting features, right? This is answering our first question of, you know, how often is, you know, a particular player unmarked in the weak side pocket? So, like, first, you know, we need to define what the weak side pocket is. Um, and, you know, in, in certain circumstances, it makes sense to handcraft these tactical features, right? Especially when they can be explained, you know, using geometric terms, very similar to how Sam was talking about, you know, open passing lanes in the first segment, right? Um, for, you know, when I talk about the weak side pocket, it's definitely a tactical term that's definitely used internally with us, but also with other teams. Um, and you can see the, you know, the image on the right where the, the right back on the blue team's got the ball, right? And the weak, weak side pocket is, is roughly defined as a, a bounding box uh, between the opposing weak side center back weak side fullback, weak side winger slash midfielder, depending on the system of play, and the defensive midfielder, of course, you can sometimes have multiple defensive midfielders, so in the, in the event that maybe it's a, you know, four two three one pivot or something, it would be the, the weak side defender, uh, weak side defensive midfielder. Um, and, and, of course, it's not exactly this, right? You know, um, 
but uh, this, this gives you a pretty good idea. So you know, the question that we had here is how often is a player unmarked in the weak side pocket? The image that I've given you here, nobody's in there, right? But for example, you know, we could have one of our blue players step into that from the midfield. You could have your left winger pinching into that, right? There's a lot of different ways that you can occupy that space, right? Um, so when we're parsing through kind of frame by frame, and you know, uh, defining this kind of geometric feature, it's just a very simple, um, you know, kind of um, just you know, if this, then that sort of thing. Uh, if, if there's a player in this space and there's you've got, you know, there's no opponent within X number of yards from them, right? Um, so you can get pretty far with uh, you know handcrafting uh, geometric features. But Sam, you want to hit the next slide here? Um, but this is definitely, you know, the weak side pocket is probably just about as abstract as a tactical term uh, that I'd really want to actually kind of define geometrically, right? Um, and, and that's because, you know, there's a clear trade-off here, right? Um, you know, the, the uh, like a, uh, that isn't a great way to explain this. Um, you know, there's a, you know, there are some, you know, there are some, uh, you know, situations that are easily explainable, right? Um, such as, you know, the, the passing lanes or is this player, you know, unmarked within 30 yards or is there, um, but it's, the problem is that it becomes um, much more difficult to uh, define abstract, you know, abstract features when you're just looking at, if you're constrained to pure geometry, right? So the weak side pocket, while we can kind of, you know, uh, define it in a geometric sense, right? There are different situations where you actually might want to define it differently depending on kind of the, the general kind of, you know, tactical context around that, right? Um, so, you know, so if you can't kind of define it in a, you know, handcrafted geometric fashion, um, and, and well, that's great because it's, this is a great first approach because it's the most explainable to the coaches. You know, you, you can say, oh, you know, this player was or was not in the weak side pocket because of this, this, and this, right? Uh, and that's like, even if you don't come up with exactly the right answer all the time, it's very easy to uh, explain why, how you got there, right? Where some of these more advanced modeling techniques that we're going to talk about, you got to take with a certain grain of salt sometimes because, um, you know, it's much harder to kind of explain how some of these, you know, unsupervised and supervised learning, you know, techniques, um, you know, give you the answer. Um, but Sam, let's hit that next slide. Um, so the next step I'm going to talk about is, um, well, the next approach is called supervised learning of, uh, you know, tactical motifs, right? This is answering our question of like, where is the left fullback when attack to defense transition is initiated, right? Um, so one thing that, you know, we don't really talk about in a club theater that much is just how valuable uh, the performance analysts codes, uh, coding is, right? So coding is, you know, it's this funny word when you walk into a club, it means something completely different than like what I thought it was, right? And, and when people think of, you know, think of coding, it's essentially just time stamping of events um, that happen during a game. So for example, at, at every game, you know, we've got our video analyst who's set up with sports code, which looks like this on your right. Um, you know, up in a tactical cam, just like how you can kind of see on the picture. Uh, and essentially, you know, he's tagging certain events that happen. Uh, they're not necessarily on ball events or kind of tactical things that our coaches want to look at at maybe halftime or post game. Right. Um, and by him tagging these things, the start and stop frames of each of these sort of tactical situations, it allows us to quickly, you know, record and recall um, those sort of events for, you know, um, review uh, in, in either a post game or a you know, halftime sort of situation. Um, this data is super valuable, right? Um, because we can help, you know, we can, we can take this data, these timestamps, these frame ranges, uh, and feed them back into new models to try to, you know, automatically, det you know, uh, detect certain tactical features, right? Um, uh, and Sam, you want to hit the next slide here? So the, um, you know, one, one way that I have found that, um, you know, in, in order to kind of build a classifier built on these timestamp uh, ranges of frames uh, provided by your, your video analyst, right, you need to um, settle on a, yeah, I'm calling it a computationally interpretable representation of the tactical configuration. So on your left, you see a, you know, 52 by 28 by 3 matrix, right, uh, that illustrates player position and movement on a per frame basis, right? Um, it's just like an RGB image, right? You know, on, on one layer, you, know, you see the you know, times three on the end there. One layer is one team, one layer is the next team, and the third layer is the ball, right? Uh, so in this situation, um, 
you know, essentially you've, you've split the field into, you know, 52 by 28 bins, right? It's either, and, and inside of that matrix, it's either a one or a zero, uh, depending if a player is in that box or not, right? And then you actually step through a couple frames and provide this sort of, um, uh, I'm calling it a shadow, right? Uh, and in this situation, you can kind of see that all the players, particularly the players in the midfield, are moving uh, from you know the the bottom towards the top, right? You can kind of see their tails. Um, and using this, um, you can you know get a. Uh, this is a, a much you know while it's not a not as good as looking at the you know raw video, right? Um, it, it actually is very this sort of um, uh, representation. It's very interpretable for computers, right? Um, they're quite good at you know using. Uh, and, and manipulating matrices, right? And, there's, um, and, and by creating a visual interpretation of your kind of tactical context, you can start to lean on you know, all kind of existing image you know, classification sort of techniques, right? Um, so there's a, a, whole, a whole ton of different stuff you can do here. Uh, so Sam, you wanna hit the next slide? I think I've got more. So for example, um, you can you know, grab this you know, 52 by 28 by three matricized uh, representation of the fields. You can feed it through some sort of modeling technique, right? Um, one, you know, one kind of architecture that I use pretty commonly in this sort of approach is like a neural network, uh, you know, feed forward convolutional um, architecture, right? And you can use that you know, kind of process through you know, how many layers you want or, or whatever to predict you know, whether a, a particular um, tactical feature is um, you know, um, presented in that, in that representation, right? And this is where that data we collect from our video analyst comes back in, right? Because that's awesome training data. And then it's just reinforcement, um, you know, and it, it, you know, it really comes down to you know, how much of a sample size you have and how good your representation is, right? Uh, but I've had a lot of success uh, building things in this sort of architecture, and you know, neural networks are are pretty uh, pretty magical, right? You can throw stuff like this and and really pretty robustly, um, you know, identify things like are we in transition or are we not, right? Uh, so, Sam, I want to hit the the next slide here. So, the last bit here is, uh, and I'm calling the you know, unsupervised encoding of tactical context, right? Um, can we find additional instances where certain things happens. Can I look at this particular frame of tactical configuration, and can I find all these other frames that look just like it, right? So for example, um, there might be a situation where, you know, Devin, you know, our right back had the ball in the situation, you know, the, you know, near side defensive midfielder was, was marked, and um, however we had, you know, these other three or four different kind of tactical things happening, right? it kind of gets very quickly beyond um, what you can do with the handcrafted features because they're, they're, they're frequently so abstract. Uh, it quickly gets beyond what you can kind of do with your, your supervised approach um, because these situations are, are frequently so bespoke that you don't really have tags for them to go and you know, build a classifier for it. So instead we need to find a slightly different approach, right? Um, and finding similar tactical situations, you know, it's an activity that coaches sink hundreds of hours into each season, right? It's the, you know, if you're trying to express a particular tactical, you know, um, uh, you know, talking point to the, to the players or, or whatever, right? So you need to not just find the one time it happened, but also other times where it happened and, and maybe there's a slightly different outcome or, you know, you need to find lots of different, you know, it's, it's just like any sort of teaching experience, right? You need to have multiple examples and, you know, ways to show and express your, your certain kind of concept, right? Um, so by encoding, you know, locations, um, of, of players into some sort of latent representation, right? A, a series of, you know, vectors, you know, a single vector with uh, multiple features, right? You know, we can potentially query uh, and uncover, you know, similar tactical situations, right? You know, um, you know, while these latent features can be generated by hands um, in a, or in a supervised manner, unsupervised approaches have provided the best results for me. Um, and, and I'd suggest probably this is generally a good way to go in the future. So Sam, I want to hit the next and maybe my last slide. Um, so one way that I found that kind of best creates these unsupervised, uh, this in a, the best way that I've created a set of, you know, um, unsupervised features has been through an autoencoder. Um, and, and while this does look scary, and sometimes it is scary when you're wiring it up, um, using, you know, existing, um, you know, uh, 
software libraries like TensorFlow and Keras make this sort of stuff really easy. Uh, and essentially what an autoencoder does is it, it, it builds a model that tries to predict a picture of itself um, by constraining it through the middle. And I'll let you guys do your own reading on this. But essentially it's a way to create um, a set of features um, that you didn't define yourself, right? And then essentially what you can do is when those features are created, those uh, encoded you know, representations in the, in the middle, um, of, of your of your architecture, you can start to take that encoded representation and just do basic distance you know uh, distance um, uh, calculations between that frame and other encoded frames and find similar instances right and this has you know been pretty successful for me in the times that I've used this it's it's great at you know finding other situations that um, that look like other uh, other things that you want to find other examples of. Um, and it can save, I think, an incredible amount of time. Now, there definitely are some problems to this, right? So as, as you see here, these, these particular examples don't have the, um, the player tails, right? So uh, this one doesn't incorporate sort of any sort of temporal sort of thing, right? Um, uh, where obviously player velocities are, are probably quite important to tactical context in a lot of situations. Um, it also weighs each player, um, in the you know with with generally the same weight right the the position of your weak side left back is just as important as the position of the guy on the ball right and, and we know kind of from a tactical sense right that those two things might not be the may be exactly right but there are some clever things that you can do to you know change the the weighting approach uh and, and the way that your uh, your distance matrices are are are, are uh, calculated uh, to get even better better results from something like this um, but I think that might be, might be it for me. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, happy for Sam and I to answer any sort of questions that you guys have. Uh, I'm not sure, Sam, how does this, how's this bit going to work? Yeah, so uh, there's like a Q&A, uh, there should be a Q&A thing on the, that you see on your screens before I had a few questions come in. Uh, and if you keep just putting them in there, we'll answer as we go. Um, so the first one is, can you share the slides after the talk? Yes, it'll be shared. Uh, second one is, how do you define the problems you seek to solve using this data, and how do you prioritize which ones to investigate? So this one's one for me. Uh, I think from our perspective, a lot of it is just talking to teams. Um, so we all have our own ideas about what is valuable, what we think uh, teams will be interested in, but really they're all guesses until we talk to people. So, um, I mean, we have like, we have a partnership with Toronto FC, which obviously is helpful in that sense, but there's lots of other clubs that we talk to um, just to get ideas for what sort of problems they have and what they think they're missing from event data. And, and just to add on that, Sam, in terms of figuring, deciding kind of what to work on, um, you know, kind of in a, in a club environment, so that can be really quite tricky, right? Because you have all sorts of projects that have different sort of, um, you know, uh, times to implementation, right? You might have a, a, a question from the coach that needs to get answered in a few hours, right? Where you have to balance long-term, you know, uh, data architecture kind of decisions, right? So um, it's really, it's, it can be really quite tricky to kind of prioritize what, what to be working on at a different time. Um, but l luckily for us, you know, because we kind of have a season and an off season, um, you know, a lot of things can be kind of split between those two different types of the year. Um, you know, where the in season stuff is much more about opposition analysis and and those sorts of things. Also depends on if our transfer window is open or shut, right? Whereas the off season, um, you know, it's much more kind of infrastructural things, um, fixing bugs that you couldn't quite get to into your your know, pipelines that um, that you uncovered along the way uh, that you really couldn't fix during the season, right? So um, you know, a lot of the kind of decisions that you uh, make in terms of what to spend your time working on is, is very much based on what what type of the what what part of the year you're in. Cool. This is a question for you, Devin. Uh, what level of certainty do you need around your models before you'll take them to a coach? Are you able to take them at to the coach at the idea stage, or they, do they need to be rock solid first? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think that. Um, it depends on what that model is trying to predict or what it's trying to do, right? Um, so, so sometimes you, you want to take the ideas of the coaches and turn them into a model, right? And in those situations, right, you know, the coach's idea can be very, um, still very abstract, sometimes very hard to define in, you know, uh, you know, an analytically friendly way, right? Uh, so in those situations, you know, that it can be, 
really just kind of a brainstorm sort of thing, right? That's, um, you know, you know, we don't know exactly how we're going to do it or even what exactly the definition of that is. So like it can be sort of abstract on that sort of end. If it's coming from the coaches, if it's coming from my end, um, it has to be a little bit more confidence. Um, it, it has to, um, it's, it's, it's tricky. Like say, for example, if you're building a, a model that ranks players, um, for, you know, on, on some sort of, you know, attribute, right. Um, I want a model that spits out a list of players that makes sense, but like not too much sense, but also like, so like if, if, a, if I'm only ever building lists of players that exactly match what the coaches or other staff are always thinking, then like, what's the point of analytics department, right? The, um, if, if we always agree on each other, right. Uh, with each other, you know, there's no, there's no real point. There's no added value. Right. Um, uh, however, I also don't want to pre uh, present a list that says, you know, that our, our, the 20th best player on our team is the best player in the league, right? So uh, trying to find that right balance um, is, is very tricky. Um, and I definitely haven't found a, you know, a exact way to do that. Um, uh, but ultimately, it's, it's kind of about building, you know, patterns of communication uh, between, you know, the analytics department and the other kind of position, you know, positions around the club. Um, and the, you know, kind of the trust, it's a trust based thing as well, right? It's, um, being able to talk soccer with the other people around the, the office and them to, you know, to trust my opinions, not just from an analytics and angle, but also with my eyes goes a long way in terms of trying to build trust of, you know, what I'm producing via model. Cool. This one is for me. Uh, has sport logics expertise in hockey proved useful in the move into soccer or the sport so different that it's essentially like starting from scratch? Uh, definitely. There's a lot of overlap. I think uh, soccer and hockey are probably the two most similar in this space. Maybe basketball is a lot we take from as well, but really at a fundamental level, I think hockey and soccer are probably the two most similar sports. Um, uh, one great example, we had uh, Karun uh, Singh recently did uh, a blog post uh, on extra expected threat in soccer. Um, it was really well received in the soccer analytics community. Um, and we ended up talking about it at our like analytic in our analytics group, which is works across multiple sports. Um, we ended up in, implementing a hockey version of it and then sent it back to Karun. And he was able to then present at the stats bomb conference, not only his model, but also that he had already been implemented in other sports. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap and it happens the other way as well, where the hockey guys have some idea that I think, oh, I hadn't thought of, I hadn't thought about something in that way before. Um, the example I always give for that is in hockey and expected goal models, pre-shot movement is much more important. So uh, if the goalie, if you force the goalie to move a lot from side to side, because the puck travels so much quicker than the ball, um, things like that, like changing angles quite quickly has a huge effect on an expected goal model in hockey wasn't something I'd really thought of implementing in soccer. And it turns out it does have an effect in soccer as well, not as big as it does in hockey. Um, but that's an example just of bringing knowledge from across the two sports. Uh, next question here, is the analysis aimed at helping the coaches for setting up training or during or during a match in real time? It's probably one for Devin. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, for the most part, you know, the work that I do is, um, is, is not while the game is going on. It, it's, it's more about, you know, kind of opposition prep. Um, and it's about, you know, uh, player recruitment uh, from other leagues, right? So I, I don't have a lot of impact in terms of, um, you know, what we're doing on the training pitch or what we're, you know, kind of doing at halftime, right? Um, you know, we, the, the data that we, you know, get from Opta, for example, we can get in a live fashion. So there are a series of reports that we have that uh, can be produced in a, in a live environment. And sometimes we found that useful. Um, and on the, the training fields, right, there's not a whole lot of impact um, that, that I have there. Um, but like one, one fun little example, you know, is, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, I think we were rehabbing a, a goalkeeper, right? And, you know, they came to me and said, Devin, you know, you know, our goalkeepers is coming back from this sort of injury. We want to limit their, um, you know, how much they're kicking during the game. So, like, actually, we're curious, how many goal kicks does a goalkeeper usually take per game, right? And how do we build them back up to that number? So kind of using you know, an event counting-based stat um, to help us, you know, better understand how to rehab a player, for example, was, was an example. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, you can, uh, I really appreciate that coaches are starting to think in that fashion and know that they can ask that question and get that answer. 
um, you know, with, with the stuff that we've already put in place. Cool. Next question here is how does tracking data collection work? Is it league based and then share it to all teams? Uh, if not, do away teams have concerns about their data being collected? I think I can answer this one. So as I mentioned at the top, there's a few different ways of collection. So when we're talking about the in-stadium installs, most of these, uh, not all of them, but almost all of them are league-wide deals. Uh, so the teams in the league will get access to every single game that's being played in that league. Um, but with things like broadcast tracking or tracking from tactical feed becoming more, uh, becoming a bigger kind of player in the field, uh, then it's not necessarily league-wide and like teams can have their own deals, but they'll probably still get data from every team in the league or from every game within a league. Uh, it'll just depend on what the request is from the actual team. In terms of away teams having concerns about the data being collected, I <laughs> I mean, Devin's probably the wrong person to ask. He'd be there, there, it's always going to be collected, right? It's whether it's off broadcast or it's not, right? It's, um, it's just a reality. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is, which leagues are ready to embrace this revolution of analytics? What is the average level of analytics usage? Um, I think from my experience, the leagues, it tends to be uh, just the leagues where there's the most money. Um, so like all the top leagues in Europe, you, you'll find analytics departments across teams in the Premier League, Bundesliga, Liga, La Liga. Um, MLS is probably a bit of an exception in terms of the relative size of the league and the fact that analytics has a bigger presence there. I don't know if you agree or disagree with that one. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and I think it's the nature of the league and the North American sporting culture that kind of has led to that, right? Um, you know, and you know, unlike other you know um, professional soccer leagues, we have a salary cap, right? So um, we can't quite throw money at situations uh, to fix them, right? We need to be a bit more clever. We need to get our roster correct from top to bottom, right? We need to be able to evaluate players not just on the top end but the t bottom end of our roster with precision, right? So analytics fits naturally into that kind of problem space. Um, in North America, I think in general, if we look at sort of how the other North American sports have, you know, beginning with baseball, definitely now in basketball, have really embraced analytics, right? I, I think that um, there's a bit of a, of a cultural, um, the, the cultural barrier is uh, just a little bit less over here in North America than you've probably seen a lot of other European leagues. Well, I think that's a good question. Is there any starting point for coaches, analysts who have no experience in TensorFlow or Keras? Any resources that you might recommend? Um, well, Sam suggested earlier um, with with the stats bomb data, right? Uh, the amount of public data that they've produced has, has been really a great resource, I think, for the greater analytics community. Um, as, as Sam suggested, there's a lot of existing sort of GitHub. Um, you know, stuff out there that you can kind of grab. I myself have produced a couple different things on, on my GitHub page, you know, um, using Python notebooks that works with that data directly and, and shows some basic, um, you know, sort of uh, methods for, for using this sort of data, right? So the resources are definitely out there. Um, um, but sometimes, uh, you know, uh, you don't necessarily know that they're out there, right? So, uh, just, just going on Googling, you know, um, you know, stats bomb and looking through GitHub uh, will definitely find you a lot of resources. There's also a lot of old great research papers out there too and, and blog posts that um, I know various people have put together kind of collections of the oldies and goodies um, uh, that you definitely go find as well. Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, I've used Keras a bit and there's a lot out there in terms of just like really basic medium posts even that go through this is how you build like a, a simple neural net using Keras. Um, but yeah, I think looking at other people's code in GitHub is probably the best way. Uh, next question, I think this is probably more directed at Devin. Uh, what is the main difficulty when it comes to communicating and vocalizing your work and its on-field applications to coaches or players? What's the biggest problem? Um, there are a lot of problems of, of different sizes. Um, the I'd say the largest problem is, is still remains um, vocabulary. Um, I think what's what's amazing to me about some of these other, at least North American sports that I have been, you know, exposed to, and, and their various analytics groups and scouting staffs, is the uh, the breadth of shared vocabulary. Right. Um, 
the the words that they use that they've you know uh, kind of you know generated over the years to you know uh, express certain very kind of nuanced uh, things that we've kind of that they've agreed upon mean these certain things um, is is really something that you don't have in soccer um, and and I'm I'm not sure exactly why that is I think it's largely um, it could be an actual language thing right soccer is played across so many different you know cultures. Um, that, you know, there's a, a literal, you know, there's a, you know, where it seems like the Germans do have a, a word for every single tactical uh, sort of feature. Um, we definitely don't over here, right? Um, so I, I think there's, um, you know, trying to figure out definitions and, you know, sharing and sticking to shared vocabulary is, is, is a large, large problem. And that's not just the problem between, you know, the analytics staff and the, the other members of, of a club, right? You definitely see that same sort of dynamic between coaches or between the scouts and the coaches um, and executives and other people, right? So um, I, I think soccer is still growing and, and can learn a lot from other sports in, in terms of how, how insiders talk about the game. So we have four minutes left and a question that I think we could spend a whole other webinar answering, but uh, would it be possible to build a database of player attributes from tracking data and from there run match simulations? Um, I mean, the, I think the easy answer to this question is that it already, it, not from tracking data, but this already, this framework already exists in like FIFA and all of these uh, and a bunch of video games. So could you improve, it's essentially the question is more, could you improve these models using tracking data? And I think the answer is 100% yes. Because right now, I don't think if, if you look at Football Manager or FIFA or anything like that, you're not actually getting any, I don't think any value uh, that could be used on a club level from that. Maybe there's some data you could, some data points that are used, but I, I highly doubt you get a lot of value out of that. But I think by putting tracking data into these models, you could definitely, I don't think we're close to it, but you could build something up where running match simulations by actually having some agent-based model where each player has attributes they're learning from tracking data is something that we could move towards in the future. I don't know what you think. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish that we ha uh, there was enough research out there to, to, get, to give a full webinar on something like this, right? Uh, I, I think it is the holy grail and it's definitely the future. Um, it really depends on how much you, how much detail you want to produce. Um, I, I, for example, built some agent-based models uh, using just off the data, right? So just essentially events, right? Like the ball is here, probabilistically, where is it going to go next? Which player is most likely to receive it, right? And then you just kind of let it go and let, let chaos take its course and then you know simulate that game x number of thousands of times to see probable score lines and things like that right um that's some you know that i haven't built that to a level that i'm confident using in any sort of applied way yet um but i do think there's a lot of future there um and just i, I also know that there are some you know uh gambling you know betting people that have built these sort of models and do use that to make money so it is actually out there on an event level um, once we start talking about the tracking level, that gets really hard. I think understanding uh, player level um, uh, movement is is really hard. Um, you know, yes, this player is a left midfielder, but these are his preferences for movement within those sort of contexts, right? So adjusting for all of that is incredibly hard. There are some ideas out there on how to do it, uh, but I haven't seen it applied yet. Um, but it is definitely something that we're thinking about. Uh, and I think a lot of other people are thinking about it as well. Uh, so I think this question is probably a good place to end. Uh, what recommendation would you have for where to start implanting data in the analysis process at a club with just basic, even Y-Scout event data? Is it, I think that question's for I'll me. I'll throw that to you, Devin, first. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, and I think each club is going to be different. It, it depends on you know who is the person who um, you know has access to that data, which person is asking for that data, right? Because I, I think that each club, you know, starting point in this sort of um, this process is going to be a lot different. Um, so I, I think it's really hard to kind of provide a, a very specific answer, right? Uh, but in general, you know, the, the people that you want to work with on, on these sorts of things are the ones that are the most comfortable recognizing their own biases, right? Um, I think we've been very blessed here at Toronto with the group that we've got is that they are, while they're, I think, incredibly intelligent, they're also very humble intellectually, right? They are open to having their, you know, their, you know, their, their, 
you know, pre, pre-held, you know, kind of positions um, challenged, right? Um, as long as you do it correctly. Um, and, uh, you know, just trying to find the right people to kind of have those sort of, you know, kind of crazy conversations with other people that um, I think are most likely to sort of help you implement these sort of things uh, on a club level. Okay, and there's actually, there's one more question. That's the last one, which is, do you see a future where all data is integrated and analyzed live? I think we're already sort of getting there. I mean, you're allowed to have iPads and the touchline now. Um, I think halftime is still probably the place where you're most able to make a difference. But with that, I don't even think you're going to be using tracking data or anything that complicated. It's probably just going to be a couple summary stats. At most, you'll have, I mean, Devin will know it's better than me, but you'll at most you'll have a minute uh, to show something. So I think, yes, I'm sure there will be uh, advances that can be made in analyzing and integrating data live but I don't think it will be as impactful as it in uh, soccer as it has been in other sports like American football, where you can stop and make decisions at each point. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, this year, early this season, I, I spent a little bit of time as our club's video analyst as the department was going through a little bit of transition. Um, and I, I find it really very difficult kind of in that, you know, halftime, you know, atmosphere inside the locker room to actually be able to implement really highly data driven stuff, right? Um, really there's no, there's, there's very little time uh, that you have and it takes a while to sort of digest some of the stuff. So if you are going to have any sort of halftime implementation, it needs to be clear, concise, and already sort of filtered, right? And, and frequently you don't really have the time to kind of do that, you know, that, that processing of the data in time. Yeah, well, cool, I think that's a good place to end it. Uh, I wanna thank Devin first off for joining um and thank everyone for coming and listening uh we'll send out an email after with the slides and uh any information about future webinars that we'll have so thank you very much thanks for having me